Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ken and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, I'd like to start off by saying that <clears throat> it's only by God's grace and His mercy that I'm clean, that I'm clean and sober. <clears throat> it's, an, it's a blessing. It's a good day to be sober. I'm not stupid enough or dumb enough to think that I'm sober on my own power. I'd like to thank Dr. Donnie for inviting me over here and for a doctor to invite someone like me who's never finished eighth grade anywhere, he must be a drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I feel highly honored to to be asked to come to Spring Branch Club because whether you all know it or not, Spring Branch is well known throughout the city and well respected throughout the city. And this is my first time coming over to a meeting, but I have heard about you all. So, <laughs> so my uh, before I even begin. Y'all notice I walked up here with this bluish looking book. I'm going to have to tell y'all. I have been accused in more than one place of being a big book thumper. No. I've been accused of that so many times that I decided to look up the word thumping in a dictionary. And I looked it up. And what it means is, it means to make a joyful noise or a joyful sound. So I said, some people just don't appreciate good music. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do before I even begin, I'm going to read something out of the textbook. And it's because I give a lot of honor, a lot of respect <coughs> To the first 100 men and women who wrote such a magnificent book, one of the greatest books I've ever read, I found discrepancies in a lot of other books throughout my life. I have yet to see one in the first 164 pages of the textbook of Alcoholics Now. So I'm going to read something because this book tells me why I'm telling my story. So I'm going to read that. I'm going to start on page 50. It's got to be 50. Yeah. It says this. In our personal stories, you will find a wide variation in the way each teller approaches and conceives of the power which is greater than himself. Whether we agree with a particular approach or conception seems to make little difference. Experience has taught us that these are matters about which, for our purpose, we need not be worried. They are questions for each individual to settle for himself. Page 29. says this, each individual in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. These give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what has actually happened in their lives. We hope no one will consider these self-revealing accounts in bad taste. Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need will see these pages and we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that they will pers be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. And that's for that newcomer. That's for that newcomer. So the main object of me doing this is to share with you all how I came to believe in a power that's greater than myself. So, 
Susan always advises me to start from the very beginning. And the beginning is, I was born. <laughs> See, I was born in New Orleans, 1952, July 15th, 10 o'clock p.m. In the, that's the hot month. So, I came up in uh, Met on Metropolitan Street, back around the woods. We had a wooden stove. We had what you call an ice box. They didn't have refrigerators. It was an ice box, actually, where people were bringing around ice uh, and put them in. A we had a kerosene lamp. We had an outhouse. That's not a restroom or a bathroom. It's an actual outhouse. You know, <clears throat> this is what we had. So we came up on the poor side. On the poor side. The thing about that is, even though raised poor in the rules of New Orleans, I was reading before I went to school. I was already reading before I went to school. One of my cousins used to read, studying in high school, used to, they taught me way before I went to school how to read. Very good. So when I would get to a word that I thought was a big word, and I tell her, I said, well, I, I can't read that. That's a big word. And she said, boy, there ain't no such thing as a big word. That big word is just a little bitty, a bunch of little bitty words. Now read that. <laughs> <laughs> so she taught me how to break down syllables. Uh -huh. So I was reading before I went to school. I had read the Holy Bible twice before I went to school. So on the first, and I was reading comic books too. Superman, Thor, Batman, Spider-Man. I used to steal comic books. You know, I had, yeah, I, I stole them. So, uh, <laughs> so when I went to school, the first day I went to school, they they used to have what you call group one, group two, group three. I don't know if y'all remember that. That's a different category that the teacher would put a person in according to the level of their reading. So when I got up to read, and I was reading, the teacher stood up, she said, you come up here, sit in my seat. You run this class till I get back. And she ran out of the classroom. <laughs> she ran out of the classroom and she came back with Mr. Waters, who was the principal, with a newspaper in his hand. So Mr. Waters reached me the newspaper and asked me to read the headline. I read the headline. He looked at me. He asked me to read the, the next paragraph. I read the next paragraph without missing a beat. The man patted me on my head and said, brilliant, brilliant. I've been suffering from a strange mental twist ever since. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I flunked first grade. <laughs> Not because the lessons was hard, I was never there. It got boring to me. I'd rather be out there stealing me a pack of cigarettes. I'm talking about six years old. In New Orleans, they didn't have a blue law, and I could buy cigarettes at will. I went to bars and all. New Orleans didn't close. I was drinking at four. They was giving me sips and whatnot. I was smoking in the house at ten with my own cartons of cigarettes. I remember my mama playing cards, tonk. Y'all ever heard of tonk? comes from William Tonk. Uh -huh. And she was gambling, you know. And I would go up on the refrigerator. I'm 10 years old at this time. And I, out of a cart, and I'd pick up a cigarette, my pack of cigarettes, and light them on the stove. And then I'd look at my mother's hand while she was gambling. And somebody said, Sister, that boy ain't got that cigarette for nobody. He's smoking that. My mama said, Them his. <laughs> Bottom line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they, they, would, they, would, they, would, they would give me alcohol So at around five years old Me and my brother called ourselves being slick Yeah So we stole What we thought Was a half a gallon of white port From our grandfather And we started drinking it And boy we just getting it just drunk I'm talking about a half a gallon now, Out the bottle And we were drinking kerosene <laughs> You know, <laughs> they rushed us to the hospital.
to bump out the stomach? Now, a normal boy would have shivered at the very thought of another bottle. You see what I'm saying? But we, I, I knew not to drink kerosene. Again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I started stealing alcohol. You know, it didn't make sense to me because I was abnormal. And I've always been abnormal. It didn't make sense to me because the boys used to say in New Orleans, they say like, uh, they be, y'all call it panhandling, outside the stores, mm-hmm. trying to get a nickel, trying to get a penny, trying to get, until they can get up enough to buy a pint. And then they would go up there and buy the pint, which to me just didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Why buy it when I can steal it? See what you, 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 if y'all understand what I'm saying, so that's what I started doing. So, in like we were poor in in our in in, in like in first grade, my mama didn't have enough money to buy us pencils and paper. So the bigger boys, you know, I knew my uncle had taught me if a guy that's bigger than me is standing in front of me running his head, that means uh talking to me in a negative manner, punch him in his mouth when he opened his mouth. He said, you might lose the fight, but he'll never stand in front of you talking to you again and running his head. <laughs> so I started making people bring me a nickel or a dime or a quarter in school, and one guy read it. That means he snitched. And uh, the, the principal took me to the, I was seven at that time, took me to the lounge, and at that time, they had a leather strap like that, uh. and about that thick. What we call child brutality, and uh, all, well, that was unknown and unheard of. Yeah. And he was whipping me in that. I mean, talking about whipping me. I'm, I'm not a not a belt. He had a leather strap. Yeah. And while he was whipping me, I was looking around the wall, and they had Louisiana pencils and stacks of paper just stacked up on the lounge. <laughs> I said. I went to all my two brothers. I said, look, man, I said, I know where all the paper at and all the pencils at in the school. They said, where at? I said, it's in the lounge. <laughs> they said, we're going to get it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so we went into the, the school and we took everything, including, this is what they used to have. They had a school bell. You know, they didn't have what you call this modern technology stuff. This, you know that, y'all, don't, y'all remember that? Any of y'all? That's, we took that, we took the pimp, we went into the cafeteria, took the big blocks of cheese, the bologna sausage, we took everything out of school and put it in the loft. The next day, we went to school, giving out packs of paper <laughs> and, <laughs> and pencils to other needy children, right? That's how we got caught, you know. <laughs> The people knew the school been hit. You understand? <laughs> so wh- when they found out we did it, you know, the, naturally the juveniles, the police got to come and they arrested us and all of this. But, you know, by me being such a brilliant student, they didn't want to prosecute us, right? The judge asked me, said, did you all break into that school? He said, yeah, we did it. He said, well, why did you do it? He said, my mommy had no paper and pencil. They got it all in the school. So they try to teach us, you know, that the ethics of not taking stuff that don't belong to us. But throughout second, third, fourth, fifth grade, and sixth grade, every teacher I had, Kenneth, do you have paper and pencil? <laughs> <laughs> That's what they did. So uh, I started moving on to other things. By this time, I'm still drinking. I progressed. My drinking went to other areas. I started robbing people, not people, businesses. You know, and I'm going to have to tell y'all, I would never stick a gun in a black person's face. I would never do that. I always rob white folks. I'm telling you. But people that's in business, like on buses and all this kind of stuff, and all of that changed there because they didn't have... uh, Machines where you couldn't get the money on a bus at the time, the drivers carried money. So one guy robbed the guy in the ninth ward in New Orleans, 
And the guy gave him the money, and he shot the guy and killed the guy. That stopped me from robbing. It stopped me. I said, he, he had no right to do anything like that, but I was a, 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 a bad child. Well, I'm drinking. I, I was drinking a lot. And one day, at I was, what, 16 years old. I had been to juvenile penitentiary twice already. To the juvenile. And like I said, juvenile penitentiary, it was an actual juvenile penitentiary. If... I'm 13, 14, 15 years old. If you have money on your books, you get two packs of red Pall Mall cigarettes and a quarter. That's juveniles they're giving this to in the, in the system. So when I come out this time, I go to the third ward. I got my gun on me, 16 years old. I'm thinking I done took all of the bullets out. So my brother was 14 on his 14th birthday. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, he said something to me. And I put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger. Bam! And he died in my arms. I'm thinking that the gun, the, 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 the gun was empty. Now I'm a juvenile at the time. Me and him had different daddies. Our last names were different. So the judge, they're thinking this is an actual murder case. When they found out that he was my brother and it was accidental, the judge told my mama, said, I'll let him out. But I'll only let him out if you get him out of the state of Louisiana. Because I had a record. I had over 100 juvenile arrests. So I had a record. And uh, my mother had a brother that was in California. And most times today, I still see it sometimes, when an incident happens at the school where there's children involved, if there's a killing or a shooting, they'll rush in with what we would call a flood of psychologists, and social workers, and uh, a therapist, and whatnot. I had never seen one of those. Mm. So it was no act, no, it wasn't, it was, it wasn't uh, nothing strange that a year later, when I went to California, a federal judge had me es escorted in chains by federal marshals saying, we don't want you nowhere in the state. That's what they did. So they put me on a plane, a jet, back to New Orleans a year later. And while I was in California's prison, I met Mexicans. <laughs> See, in New Orleans, we didn't have Mexicans. You understand what I'm saying? It was straight. I'm telling y'all, they may have had some, but I wasn't in no close proximity to any of them. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I found out that they would do anything I said do. I found out that I related to them. They somewhat looked like me and whatnot. So I'm already in a, 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 a prison. So I decided to use them to initiate riots and whatnot. That's how I was kicked out of the state of California. And when they put me in solitary confinement, I was too, just too dangerous. And uh, one guy named Johnny Walker Ray, that was his actual name. <laughs> he slipped a Black Panther newspaper under my door cell. I picked up the Black Panther newspaper and I became politically educated. <laughs> I start understanding why the pigs was all uh, uh, in the establishment and why blacks was doing so much suffering and you know uh, something about uh, 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 slavery. You know, I, I actually said, well, that's the reason. Because even though I was reading, when I went to school, I was reading books like See Dick Run, see Spot, see Puck, Officer Friendly, and all of this kind of stuff. But in my neighborhood, Officer Friendly didn't apply to me. He would say, that when the police would see me, he said, put your... Don't say, don't say, don't say. Put your hands up against the car. You monkey mother so-and-so, you put your hands up on the car. When you get to seven, when you get 17 w w years old, this is what they promised me. I was arrested on sight. You can give your soul to the Lord because your behind gonna belong to me. That's what they told me. So, uh, Dick, Jane, Spot, and Sally didn't apply to me. I didn't have that lifestyle. <laughs> I just didn't have it. So, oh man. <laughs> so. My illness progressed. It got so... I'm going I'm to share, share something with y'all. I had my first experience with house cleaning. 
my bad experience with house cleaning when I was about between six and seven. I have to say this to you. Me and my brother would have to either clean the house or clean the kitchen. So when I would clean the kitchen, my sisters wouldn't have to do anything. They would make us do the work. So when I would clean the kitchen, I'm washing the dishes, I'd wash one or two dishes and put all of the dirty dishes under those dishes. <laughs> and I'd sweep stuff under the rug. And that, remember I told you, they didn't have child abuse at that time. And what we wore was slingshot draws. So at 2 o'clock in the morning, my father would come in with a switch. That I'm talking, the switch is something off a tree. And I'm, I ain't got nothing on but them slingshot draws. And he'd be whipping me, and when I'm waking up, you know, and right now they call it child brutality. But every time he hit me, a whip would jump up, you know. And he would grab me, and he'd hold me by the arm. I'm trying to get away, and this is the things he would say. I never forgot it. He said, once a job you have begun, wham, wham, never quit until it's done. Wham, wham. He said, be the labor, great or small. Wham, wham, do it well or not at all. That's what he told me. And I never forgot it. I never forgot that. It reminds me of when I came back in here, effectively, 2004 Christmas Eve. And my sponsor, when I lollygagged on the fourth step, I delayed. He asked me, he said, what are you afraid of in step four? He said, if you're scared now, your behind need to go back to step two. He said, because you haven't come to believe yet. He said, and as you show, it's not going to turn your willing life, your will and your life over the care of nothing you don't believe in anyway. And I knew that he was the kind of person that would take a person backwards in the steps. And I remember what my father had told me about starting a job and not finishing. So I went on ahead and I did what I had to do. And thank God for that, I'm standing here today. That's the reason. But I remembered what I had with my first experience in house cleaning. So what happened, I came up here, my life had progressed to the point where I had become broken. My pride had been broke down. And when I came to the room, 2004, I, did, I wasn't coming to a meeting. Somebody told me they had free food down the street. <laughs> and I went to the meeting, but I, I saw the food, but I couldn't get the food unless I went to the meeting. So I went to the meeting, and what they were saying in the meeting, the way, what I felt, the joy, what they were sharing, it's Christmas Eve. It was an alcathon. I said to myself, Ken, it's your home now. That's the feeling I got. And I went up and picked up a desire chip. And before I got back to my seat, a guy named Tyreek, right there, grabbed me by my hand and brought me to another guy I ain't never seen. Him. <laughs> and said, this is your sponsor. With all of the intellectual pride I had, I said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't play with me. No, no. He put me straight into the steps. When I got to step three, my sponsor started telling me about self. He started telling me about drugs and alcohol, Kenny. It's not your problem. I thought he was crazy. <laughs> he started telling me about selfishness and self-centeredness being the root of my problem. Then I have to make a decision which is going to lead me into faith. Because when he started telling me about God, I tried to tell him some things about God too. I remember I told you I had read the book? Yeah. I had been reading all my life. Yeah. So I tried to tell him about the faith I had. Uh -huh. He told me... He said, Kenneth, you ain't got no, I don't want to tell you what, exactly what he said, but he said, you don't have no faith. He put expletives before it. <laughs> he said, all you have is a bunch of information with no application. He said, and information without application is just that. I didn't like that. And I said to myself, is that true? 
And I had to admit that it was true. And I said to myself, I'm going to fix it where he never tell me that again. So I stopped reading the big book so I could quote the big book or know the big book. I started reading the big book so I can learn how to apply what I was reading. And it was then that my life changed. It was then that I started finding out that the big book was written like the doctor said it was written in masterly detail. The doctor said it gave him a sense of real satisfaction when he was asked to contribute a few words on a subject which is already covered in masterly detail. I started looking up masterly. I started looking up detail. I found out that detail means the small elements, the small component parts that make up a wondrous and magnificent whole. I start seeing a theme running through the book. I start, because I was analyzing things. See, after coming out of juvenile penitentiary, I start going to adult prison, and I became a lawyer. I told you all I never finished eighth grade, right? I became what you call a jailhouse lawyer. I filed writs. I get people out of prison when their lawyer couldn't get them out. I was a smart son of a gun. And when I came up in the room, I start analyzing the big book like I was analyzing all other books. Then I read later on that Bill said when he wrote the 12 steps that he had closed every avenue whereby a rationalizing alcoholic can find a loophole. Like he knew I was coming. And I came. <laughs> I looked up the fate. They told me because he kept telling me, my sponsor kept saying, quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. Well, what idiot wouldn't want all his problems solved? <laughs> the, the thing now is, how do I link the principle with the step? So in order to take step three, me, I want to understand things. They're giving me faith. They tell me that i got to be convinced that any life that's run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we are almost always in collision with something or somebody. Bill used the word collision because they're about to explain to me what they mean and what they say. Right before that, they said, being convinced, we were at step three. And they got, we were at step three in italicized letters because step three mentions itself twice. And I'm saying, Bill was a prolific writer. I know something about the law. Bill was a lawyer. Why would he use such terms? <laughs> because right after that, he said, just what do we mean by that and what do we do? The key word for me was at. The word at means in the vicinity of or at the location of, but not necessarily there. So he's going to tell me what he means, and then when he gets... Further on, I got a good understanding of selfishness and self-centeredness. He's going to say, now, at this time, we are at step three, right? Uh -huh. So I'm trying to find out how faith is actually connected to step three. He used the word collision. Now, I know for a fact <coughs> that if I'm going to turn, I know the earth turns. It turns on an axis. Every time the earth turns towards the sun, it comes into the light. Whenever it turns away from the sun, it goes into darkness. That's a principle. It's an established fact. It's science. It's a law. So if you all are giving me principles, then it must be true physically, mentally, spiritually. However, if it's not conforming to the natural creation, I don't see it as a principle. So if the earth is turning and it's heavy, at the same time it's turning, it's hurtling and traveling through space. And it takes approximately 365 days to complete this orbit. It's moving so smoothly, so mathematically exactly, that we count our time according to the way it moves. Right or wrong? Right. We've been counting our time according to the way, the way the Earth moves for a long time. While it's doing all this traveling, it's heavy. The last weight of the earth that I've heard was uh, six sextillion tons. I have never heard it disputed yet. But the, but the, the, whole, while, <laughs> the whole while the earth is turning and moving, it has no steering wheel and no motor. Yet it's magnificently traveling. 
and it's not colliding with anything. Imagine if the earth was to develop some self will. <laughs> <laughs> Feces. 
smell so bad. Showing you how building them ropes. That I don't want nobody to smell it. I have to humble myself and let somebody else come in, a PC specialist who've been used to staring this stuff around, tell me, say, Kenneth is not the green messing with you is the bean. Y'all hear what I'm saying? <laughs> so I get the humility to want to have all of this moved out the way. I become willing because I know what it is. I know what I am now. I did a fourth step. I've seen myself. So when I get to that seventh step, I become humble. I can't do it. You know, I humbly ask him. They're going to say, when ready, we say something like this. Notice the language. When they say, when ready, we say, they're telling me I'm just talking. We say something like this. I'm now ready that you should have all of me, the good and the bad. I pray that you now remove every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. All of those words are implying time. Then they say, now it's time for more action, right? Because I was just talking in step 10, I mean step 7. Once I say the seven step prayer and I realize that my defects, if I really want God to remove them, they have caused harm to other people. And I'm going to have to become willing to go back and straighten out my life and straighten out the harm that I've done to other people. So they said, now it's time for more action. And if you really look at it, the way the 12 steps are written, the very way they are written shows us that faith without works is dead. After the third step, which is a faith step, comes action. After the seventh step, which is a faith step and prayer, comes action. After the eleventh step, which is a faith step in prayer comes action. they showing me in the very right and deal ain't left nothing, no nook, cranny, or crack for me to hide in. So I had to make a list of all of the people I had home and became willing to make a, a man to them all and I made by recommends to the people I had home. Some I haven't made yet, but everything that I can, could make amends, I went and made amends. I went to any god darn list. That's what I did. And after I did that, I had what the book promises me. A new freedom and a new happiness. I had it. I actually had it. Something I had ex not experienced in my entire life. You think I want that back again? That misery that I had? No, you're not going to refund no misery to me. <laughs> yes, I'm a, whatever I got to do to keep this, I'm going to do it. I am going to do it. I have to look at that clock because there ain't none in front of me. <laughs> but uh, after, after that, I got on and I learned since I had already did a thorough fourth step, my sponsor took me through ten. And I was well equipped. I was well equipped to know how to continue taking personal inventory. I knew that whenever I was disturbed, I didn't care who or what, or no matter what I think or who I think caused the problem, something was wrong with me. I know how to check my feelings by what's being affected in me. I know how to check my self-esteem when it's being affected. I found out that I can't get angry. I can't get disturbed. I cannot get upset unless one of my basic instincts is threatened. And I learned what there was in the fourth step in the textbooks of Alcoholics Anonymous. My self-esteem. I'm supposed to have a certain level of self-esteem, but it's not supposed to over exceed itself. My sex instinct, my pride, especially unwarranted pride, my security, my financial security, all my emotions, I learned that to check myself, I learned that as a product of Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not know that. And I learned how to pray in Alcoholics Anonymous. When I learned, when he took me to the 11th step, praying only for the knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. I learned for the first time that all my prayers were in vain. All of them. I read one book said you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask in a, in a messed up manner, if you understand what I'm saying. I learned how, <laughs> I learned how to pray in Alcoholics Anonymous. I learned how to pray for others. If you can imagine a self-centered 
person like myself who would not give a person the time of day with a watch on. I remember, I remember, I, I wouldn't, because by being from New Orleans and the streets of Houston, a guy asked me what time it is. I know it takes me two seconds to take my eyes off of you and anything can happen. I wasn't about to do it. I remember coming off Main Street going in the fourth ward, and a guy said, Sir, sir, could I ask you something? I said, You just did. I had no time for nobody. I really didn't. Then my sponsor started telling me I got to go work with somebody else. And boy, I had come this far. He told me, go take somebody through the steps like he took me through the steps. Boy, I hurried up. I waited for the first newcomer to come in at me. And I snatched him. I said, I'm going to take you through the steps. Because I knew one thing. Once I take him through the steps, well, hell, that's 12 steps. It's 12th grade. I'm finished. <laughs> I have graduated. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Never graduated from nowhere else. Oh, yeah, I did graduate from uh, elementary school. But <laughs> well, <laughs> when I did that, I told him, I said, look, I've already done that. What's next? He said, find somebody else. And I started learning. So now I'm looking for the principal in step 12. Principles govern all steps. See, a newcomer come up here, you see the steps written on the wall, but he does not see the principle that governs, really governs the step. I need a sponsor for that. So step 12 was service work. Service work. How do I find that law running through nature? In creation. How can I find that? I know one thing. I don't know about most of you all. But at some different times in my past history, I have urinated on the ground. <laughs> most most of you all don't look like the kind of people that would ever do anything like that. <laughs> but uh, but I am. And uh, fifteen minutes, fifteen twenty minutes later, I found out that it had gone. Well, what happened to it? The sun dried it up into a, an imperceptible mist that my eyes couldn't see. And it drew it up the same way it does with dew and with all other water. I found out that there's no new water on the planet. The same water that's here now has been here billions of years. I found out that when the sun dries it up, it goes up into a... Uh, it becomes purified at a certain point. And it formulates it into clouds. And then the clouds go find dry land and rain that repurified urination back down. <laughs> so what happened is the 12 steps, the 12 steps, my defects was gone, right? Lifted out, right? The 12 steps raised me up. And I was told to come back down. The problem with that is some clouds get puffed up with pride. And they don't want to give up their water. And lightning and thunder bust their behind up. You're coming down one way or another. That's the bottom line. <laughs> so I found out. I found out that service work was indeed a principle. So if a person, let's say a Ku Klux Klansman, a tobacco spitting Ku Klux Klan, was to tell me, Kenneth, I don't believe in God because if there was a God, he would have never created such a thing as a nigga. I tell him, keep coming back. <laughs> so, to show you I'm serious, I was in the men's center. They had a, I'm not going to say white, because this is white, <laughs> and I ain't never seen a white man, but they had a guy <laughs> who, who was sitting in, I, I, I'm serious, I hope I never see one. You know what <laughs> this guy was sitting in the meeting, he had been coming to the meeting two weeks, he never said a thing. One day, after everybody left out, I was getting ready to go outside and smoke a cigarette. 
He said, Kenneth, could I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah. I said, I know. I said, what's going on? He said, I'm a clam. My daddy was a clam. My grandfather was a clam. He said, I got a problem with niggas. He said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, but I've been listening to you for two weeks. He said, I think you can get me through these steps. Can you take me through these steps? I told him, that's like asking me if I want to breathe. <laughs> I took him through the steps, and he recovered. He was a lawyer. He left. I ain't seen him since. <laughs> this, this, this program is awesome. I'm telling you, when they say it gets indescribably more wonderful as time passes, as time passes, I'm going to tell you all, I have not had one miserable day since I've been in recovery. I have went through situations that would make a brass monkey cry, but I ain't never had one miserable day since I've been in recovery. I've had a new, a whole new outlook on life. One time, after I've been taking through the steps for a year, a year, my mother passed away during Katrina, right after Katrina. That night, I knew she was already almost mummified. They had her wrapped up and whatnot. She was, three doctors had pronounced that she ain't gonna wake up. But that next morning, she was unconscious. I had a meeting to go do. And I went and did the meeting. And I didn't share nothing about that. I did my meeting. Then I went to the hospital. When my sponsor found out about it, well, my sponsor said, man, I didn't know. What happened? How can I help? How, he was genuine, genuinely concerned. I, how can I help you? What can I do? What can I do? I told him, I said, Patrick, I didn't say God died. I said my mama died. I didn't have a whole new outlook and attitude change about life. When I went to the funeral, to the wake, Susan was there. I, I told my sister, we don't want no Baptist preacher lying on our mama talking about how good of a woman she was when we all know she liked to play cards and horses. <laughs> we ain't going to let nobody talk about her except the people who knew her. And that's what we did. And then when they started crying, I said, y'all know how sister was. She didn't want nobody. She didn't even like going to wakes and funerals where people trying to get into the casket with the dead person. She didn't like, so y'all need to stop all that crying, you know, because she didn't like all that stuff. And they all, the tears looked like they started going back in the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't recovery good? That's, that's what recovery has done. Recovery, rec recovery has actually done that for me and much, much, much more. It's given me a fellowship. It's given me people to call and to be called on. I'm telling y'all in step 12, if I'm having conjugal relations and my phone ring, I'm getting up. Thank you all for letting me share. <laughs>